Welcome to Alaska Earthquake Science Facts. My name is Carl Tate. These slides are part of a set of mini talks for the earthquake section of the course, Glaciers, Earthquakes, and Volcanoes, offered at University of Alaska Fairbanks. I hope that others will find this content interesting as well. You can find the playlist off Carl Tape AK YouTube channel. And I'm going to here give an introduction to what these talks are about. So who am I? I am a seismologist at University of Alaska Fairbanks at uh, Geophysical Institute. This probably shows a typical view of my working life, which is sitting in front of a computer, looking at wiggles of seismograms, trying to understand how waves propagate through complex materials. Um, but I've also had my fair share of adventures. This shows one of them uh, taken in Nenana, Alaska after servicing some stations on the Tanana River. Um, but I'm from Alaska. I love Alaska. I love seismology. And I hope to convey some of that excitement with you. Here's a view of campus, University of Alaska Fairbanks taken in the fall. And when I look at this, we all see something different. It's a beautiful place. Uh, but when we look at the structures here on campus, we can connect them with some of the material in these lectures I'll have. First, we see in the engineering building here, there's seismometers on each floor to record the building's response to earthquakes. The Eielson building shown here from 1935 housed the second seismometer uh, ever in Alaska. This Chapman building was the orig original geophysical institute, which was in, uh, formed as an act of Congress in 1947 mainly for the geographic advantage of studying high latitude geophysics, such as the Aurora. The Reichart building is where the Department of Geosciences is, and then the upper campus where Geophysical Institute is. We'll zoom in on that next. So here's a view from Westridge upper campus. And again, we can do the same thing, kind of break this down as the seismologist view here. And what we find from left to right, we have the Butcherfitch building with high performance computing, seismic data acquisition. We have Alaska satellite facility dishes one, two, and three. There is a sal satellite calibration corner reflector in the parking lot, International Arctic Research Center. Here's the Geophysical Institute where I am. Um, on the fifth floor, we have the Wilson Alaska Technical Center for infrasound focus. We have the University Affiliated Research Center for GDNP, which stands for Geophysical Detection of Nuclear Proliferation. On the fourth floor, we have Seismology and Geodesy. On the third floor, Alaska Earthquake Center and Volcanology, including the Alaska Volcano Observatory. We have the Westridge Research Building with remote sensing, Alaska Satellite Facility. Out in the woods, there's IS-53, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization Infrasound Array. Out in the woods, we also have IU Cola, which is a USGS Global Seismograph Network Station. And in the foreground, the uh, Museum of the North that includes um, Shake Alaska, which is a virtual delivery of a nice exhibit on earthquakes you can check out online. So this is an exciting place for being in science, in seismology, in terms of data acquisition and how we try to understand uh, all these seismic data. So what are the criteria for these Alaska earthquake science facts? First, I wanted to make them interesting. Um, that's subjective, I know, but um, that's, that's the bar. Simple enough to remember and share at a social gathering. So there's some exciting and interesting topics to me, but things like say anisotropy or shear wave splitting, this, this is not easy to explain. Uh, at a social gathering. So uh, we want to highlight an earthquake concept, could be wave propagation, shaking, duration, specific to Alaska. We'll see Alaska everywhere uh, in, these, in these talks. Globally unique is difficult, but that's saying something special here that you can't find elsewhere. And there's, there's some subjectivity there as well. And finally, supported with evidence from peer-reviewed scientific publications. This is a really key part. We're not just doing a Google search online and picking up content, but I'm presenting information that's gone through the peer review process, which is a high standard 
for science. It doesn't mean that everything's correct in peer reviewed publications, but it's the best starting point we have for conveying the evidence behind these facts. So Alaska focus, what does this word even mean? Alaska is derived from the Aleut word Alaska, meaning object to which the action of the sea is directed. It's kind of a fascinating definition in the context of what we'll be talking about, such as tsunamis. Out of Wikipedia, we see it was introduced in the Russian colonial period, referred to the uh, Alaska Peninsula, derived from this Al Aleut language. So if we think about object to which the action of the sea is directed, to me, it brings up tsunami. And what I'm showing here is a map of a 1788 earthquake and tsunami that impacted Aleuts and Russians. So four years after Russians uh, colonized with their first settlement here in Kodiak, they get hit with a magnitude eight and a half to nine earthquake. This is showing tsunami heights, three to 10 meters, possibly 30 meters in Unga, Senek Island. And so this is the kind of interesting aspects of within these science facts, but for me, object to which the action of the sea is directed. This is just the Alaska Peninsula here. Um, and this is showing uh, Kodiak and one of these components. So if you need a map of Alaska, put your hand, take out your right hand, kind of form what looks like maybe a pistol or something and turn it around. And that gives you a good starter for a map of Alaska. So this is just the pointer finger here of the Alaska Peninsula. Basic format. For each YouTube video and slides, there's gonna be a statement of the fact on one slide, explanation of the background and supporting evidence. That could be anywhere from two to 30 minutes, um, depending on how much content I thought was needed. Then there'll be one slide with the takeaway points and then end notes. So I would say to anyone, don't just accept the facts, consider the evidence that's being presented. Um, the evidence will be easier to follow once we're equipped with a basic understanding of plate tectonics and earthquake science. So for students in the class, you know, by the end of the class, we have a few fundamentals that we need to really appreciate and take in a lot more in these videos. And to really see the supporting evidence, you can dig into the peer reviewed papers that are cited and listed in the end notes. So suggestions for students. I would say at the start of the class, read through each fact, which are stated in the second slide and the takeaway points that are near the end and write down any terms and concepts that are unfamiliar. Glance at some of the slides just to see what interests you. And at the end of the class, watch the videos, focus on understanding the evidence that supports the facts and the takeaway points. I do not recommend trying to understand the details on every slide unless you already have some background in Alaska tectonics. Goals for the students. I'd encourage you to improve our understanding of earthquake science, Alaska earthquakes, Alaska geography, and its rich and old cultural history, Alaska plate tectonics. I want us to be able to read maps. This is central to geophysics and geology, interpreting contours, colors, symbols, reading legends. Reading maps, also understanding cross sections. We'll see this over and over. We cut the earth if it's a geologist or it's looking at earthquakes and cross section. We need to sort of get our three dimensional thinking caps on when we cut through the earth. Which way is this cut? Uh, you know, as we look at these examples. Understanding spatial scales of length, area, and volume, and especially understanding time scales. Earthquakes happen in matters of seconds, but the processes of years to millions of years of plate tectonics um, are all important to understanding how the mountains got where they are and when is the next earthquake might be happening. Here's a generic picture of a subduction system. And this is central to Alaska because much of Alaska as we see has a subduction plate boundary. If we look at this generic system, we can ask ourselves in Alaska, where are the pieces of Alaska that fit in with this picture that could be applied in many places around the world? And so for that, we say, where are these features? We could say, well, this upper plate is the North America plate. The subducting plate under North America is the Pacific plate. And picking a particular profile, say through Cook Inlet near Anchorage, we could say that this four arc basin or this basin that is in front of the volcanic arc um, is Cook Inlet. 
we can look at this interface that's labeled Megathrust and think about the 1964 magnitude 9.2 earthquake that occurred there. Maybe this volcano is readout volcano. So when we see these generic concepts, we want to think, how does Alaska fit in with that? And here's a great perspective on Alaska. You know, north is to the left here, but on this scale, we have the Pacific plate subducts beneath the North America plate. And this shows the direction of the Pacific plate moving sort of toward and under Alaska. So it dives under Alaska. And as it goes down, there is a arc of volcanoes that occurs along the Aleutian Islands. These are all volcanoes associated with the subduction of the Pacific plate under the North America plate. So this line right here is the trench, the bathymetric low where you last see the Pacific plate if you remove the ocean on the seafloor. And we see also that on the boundary over here, the Pacific plate moves side by side relative to North America. So we can look at how this one picture provides us with sort of the three settings for plate tectonics in Alaska. And the first one is thrust faulting along the Aleutian Alaska megathrust. And that term will come up uh, in one of the talks. It was in fact first applied in this uh, subduction setting. And here what you have is the North America plate is thrust up and to the right as the Pacific plate goes under it. So on this contact is where all these large earthquakes occur, such as the 1964 earthquake, and they also generate tsunamis. The second set is right lateral strike slip faulting along the Fairweather Fault. You can think of this fault as almost a, a northern San Andreas Fault, only slipping faster. Um, but right lateral means that if you're standing on North America, looking out toward the Pacific Plate, the Pacific is moving past you to the right. And that's what you can see here by the schematic. So the North America Plate is over here, and this boundary as it slides by, that's the Fairweather Fault. And the third one is in between, and it's collision. It's a collision between this Yakutat block, which is essentially a, a plateau, an oceanic plateau riding on top of the Pacific plate, but it does not want to be subducted. It does not want to go down. And there it is getting shoved down and creating the highest coastal mountains uh, in the world. 14 of the 20 highest mountains in North America are right in here in the St. Elias, Wrangell St. Elias Mountains. So it's a spectacular example of plate tectonics. And along with this plate tectonics and mountains come some huge earthquakes. And we'll focus on some of those. So that's the intro. I encourage you to check out these science facts. There'll be a summary after this of all the facts one after the other. And then you can pick and choose what you're interested to follow. And if you have any feedback, please um, send me an email, let me know. Thanks for your interest.